morning from the North Fork Valley. We need rain here. And so as we open in prayer, we want to pray for rain, that the skies would open, the clouds would come, and grant us some moisture because we've got fire, fires everywhere, just like California. Our firefighting teams are maxed out. So would you join us in prayer where two or three are gathered? In my name, there he is in the midst. And where two or three agree as touching anything, be it done unto us, Lord. We're asking right now that you would rain down on us. We need moisture. We need rain. And we need the rain of your presence, R-E-I-G-N, Lord. You know what I'm talking about. We need rain, and we need the rain of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So rain in our hearts. Holy Spirit, guide us and bless us to be a blessing. And we are in desperate need of your hand. And we thank you that you are present and you are working your will in our lives. Lord, we just thank you and praise you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Here's a reminder of some of the most powerful weapons that you have. The Bible says, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, rulers of the darkness of this world. They are powerful. The Bible says they're powerful. And it says, therefore, put on the whole armor of God. It's not just put on a few pieces that we're familiar with but clothe ourselves in the armor of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It's his presence, the hem of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, which is in Jesus Christ, the shield of faith to, fight, to ward off the attacks of the devil, the sword of the spirit, the, which is the word of God, and our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, that where our foundation is peace, we do not ever lose our peace because Jesus is the Prince of Peace and putting on the belt of righteousness and truth because that's our strength, that's our core. The truth shall ultimately set us free from fear and from frustration and our faith will be healthy and alive because we know God is still on the throne and prayer changes things. So pray without ceasing is another practice every day that we communicate. We're in, our heart is in communication and our mind is formulating uh, scripture and communication with the Lord and we understand what he's saying to us and we, we are believing him and we're trusting him and we're renew, renewing our mind each and every day. So we need to armor up, we need to pray, and we need to praise. The Bible says, Lift up our praise. Praise be unto God who gives us the victory. And all things give thanks for this is the will of God and Christ concerning you. Enter his gates with thanksgiving in our heart. Enter his courts with praise. It prepares our heart. It helps lift our spirit and softens us, makes us receptive and causes our environment to become receptive to the movement of the spirit of God. And so we praise God for these avenues of the weaponry we have to armor up, to pray without ceasing, to praise the Lord because in praise it drives the enemy back. There's victory in praise. And also there's a, a precision placement that God wants to put us in the right place. When there's a shaking going on and that which is eternal is proving itself to be eternal and it's standing the test, but that which is not of God is getting shaken, it's being removed and it's, it's being exposed for what it is. And so in that time of shaking, God positions his people. And this is a, a, a move of God, this is a will of God in the time of shaking to precisionly place his people uh, ready to do his work, placed in his kingdom. And Ezekiel chapter two, chapter 22, and you can read verses 23 through 31, but it reads, like this in verse 29. It's talking about the state of the land. Israel was very backslidden at the time. America is struggling at this time. And so there, the parallels are uh, just powerful. In verse 29, it says, the people of the land have practiced oppression and committed robbery. They have wronged the poor and needy and have oppressed the sojourner without justice. And here's what God says. I searched for a man among them who would stand in the gap before me for the land, so I would not destroy it, but I found no one who would build up the wall and stand in the gap, it says. And uh, so God is looking for someone to precisionally place 
while he's in the midst of shaking and moving and uh, revealing himself to us and to this world. So my encouragement to you is where is God placing you? We've been studying Nehemiah and God placed him as a cupbearer to the king. And uh, God placed also Daniel as one of the wise men. And as we see in Daniel chapter two, God used him mightily and uh, he was uh, working the will of God he was moving in a pagan culture under a pagan king, and God can do anything, anywhere. Would you not agree that God used Nehemiah, pre precisionally placed him, he placed Daniel, he placed Moses where he was, because Moses has been Pharaoh, Pharaoh's court. Nobody was more qualified and prepared than Moses to be a leader in Israel at the time. And uh, so God is wanting us to sense his spirit and move into the gap and rebuild the wall. And uh, it says in 2 Chronicles seven fourteen, if my people who are called by my name would humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will heal their land. And so this is the promise of God. God wants us to move into the gap. And when we see our society move, moving further and further away from scripture, we need not back off in fear and frustration. God is calling, God is looking for someone he can place in that gap who will represent him, who will speak for him, who will shine for him, who can stand the pressure because the power of the spirit of God's on them and the grace is just flowing in them and through them. And so we see this in Daniel, in Daniel chapter three, we studied chapter one last week and God is revealing a dream to a pagan king. And it's an amazing setting and Daniel is strategically placed standing in the gap and we love these opportunities because we see the sovereignty of God. If anything, this dream reveals the sovereignty of God. Also the free will of man, Daniel didn't have to, but he was responding to God. He was moving into the gap and uh, God was revealing himself uh, to a pagan king named Nebuchadnezzar in a world empire called Babylon. And we pick it up in Daniel chapter two. And uh, it says, now in the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams and his spirit was troubled and his sleep left him. And we live in a day right now, the frustration, the fear and confusion is rising so high. But God does not want us to focus on that. God is shaking things up. God is in the middle. God is not fretting. He's not saying, oh, this is so out of control. No, when it's out of control, God gets in control by using his people. And so when people are fearful and troubled, what an opportunity divinely set up by the Lord for his people to move into the gap, just like we see Daniel. Uh, and it goes on to say in verse number two, then the king gave orders to call in the magicians, the conjurers, the sorcerers, the Chaldeans, which was the educated department, uh, to tell the king his dream. So they came in and stood before the king and the king was, uh, um, proud and arrogant enough to say, you're not only going to reveal to me the interpretation, but I want you to reveal the dream to me. So here's a sovereign move of God taken and out of the natural. There would be no counterfeit interpretations. Only God was going to be able to reveal this dream. And God's man was courageous enough, full of faith, and with discretion and discernment, it says in verse 14, Dave, uh, Daniel steps into the gap and interprets, and cry, first of all, he prays, and he praises the Lord for the answer. In 19 on, he goes verse after verse, he's praising the Lord. So these things you can see, prayer, praise, he's armor, armored up, he's in the zone, in a pagan environment, but God is using him. So I encourage you today, do not back up in fear and frustration. Let the Spirit of God stir your faith and step forward like David did, and uh, Daniel did, and God gave him the interpretation. And it was a marvelous dream, a dream of world implications we can hang our hat on. It's God speaking 
even though he is speaking through a pagan king, and the Bible says the heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord, and he turneth it whithersoever he will. Isn't that beautiful? That's Proverbs 21, verse 1, that God can use even a pagan king. God can use, that's what sovereignty means. It means God can do what he wants, when he wants, how he wants to do it. And uh, we have a free will to respond and step into the gap. And God is calling us right now in America to step into the gap and uh, stir our faith and step in with confidence and courage that God in this time is revealing himself and he's getting the glory. After the interpretation comes through Daniel, it says in verse 26, the king said to Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, are you able to make known to me the dream which has been seen in its interpretation? And here's Daniel. He's going to he's gonna point and give all the glory to God. And Daniel answered before the king and said, As for the mystery about the king has inquired, neither wise men, conjurers, magicians, or diviners are able to declare it to the king. However, <laughs> you know, there's a lot of things going on in America and around the world after the newscast, uh, you gotta say, however. When people are then talking about all the things that are going on, we have to insert, however. God is not deceived. God is not mocked. We are sowing what we reaped. But however, there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries and he has made known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what will take place in the latter days. This was your dream and the visions in your mind while you on your bed. And 24 times in the next few verses, it's interesting. Daniel says to the king, this was revealed to you. It was your mind, your dream, your interpretation. What is he doing? I think he's, he's uh, the spirit of God is wanting Nebuchadnezzar to take personal responsibility. I'm encouraging you to read Daniel chapter 9. We're going to look at it in the coming weeks. Daniel takes personal responsibility and confesses. He's reading in Jeremiah, and he's realizing that the 70 days is almost up, of, the 70 years of captivity, excuse me, were almost up. And he, and he was confessing, and he was beginning to praise God for what God was about to do because he was reading Jeremiah and uh, Jeremiah says, I, God speaking, I know the plans that I have for you, not to harm you, but to bless you in this latter end. And so he's reading that and he's getting stirred and he's taking responsibility. So from God's people taking responsibility and God can stir even, even pagan kings around the world. <clears throat> the most obscure, dark places, God's light, by it, the spirit of God can move in and make reveal his will and bring conviction and responsibility to whomever. The heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord and he turns it whithersoever he will. Now, for a minute, let's look at our remaining time. What was this image? What was this dream and the image that was revealed in Daniel uh, chapter two and on in chapter three? It was, a, it was a huge image of which the top of it was gold. The head was gold, which represented Babylon. And uh, the chest area was silver, which represented the Medo-Persian, because we have the benefit of looking back in history to realize God was specific, specifically speaking to the kingdoms that would rule the world. And then he went on to say, and the uh, waist part was in bronze, which would be the Grecian empire, or the Grecian rule of Greece. And then the latter part with the legs and the feet, uh, which uh, ended up divided into 10 toes, which uh, that was a Roman government. There was 10 divisions in the Roman government. And uh, it was iron and clay, uh, the iron representing the strength and clay the fact that it was divided and fragile. But most beautifully is what is revealed, and this happened in exactly in history, and it's unfolding right before our very eyes. In chapter two, verse 44, he gets to what happens to the image. 
He said, in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed. And that kingdom will not be left to another person. It will crush and put an end to all these kingdoms, but it will itself endure forever. What kingdom is he talking about? He's talking about the Lord Jesus Christ, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who took uh, his life made it a sacrifice for sin. Colossians chapter 2, he uh, took the certificate of death that was upon us and he took it to the cross. He nailed it and he triumphed openly. Colossians chapter 2 says that and he ascended to the right hand of the Father, the death, burial, and resurrection, the ascended, ascension to the right hand of the Father and he's sitting at the right hand of the Father building his kingdom. And it is ever increasing. Do not be deceived. God is building his kingdom, just like Jesus said. And it goes on to say, Insomuch as you, Nebuchadnezzar, saw that a stone was cut out of the mountain without hands. Without hands, it wasn't human. This was a God. This was a move of the sovereignty of God. He took uh, out of the mountain a rock. And that it crushed the iron and the bronze and the clay and the silver and the gold. And the great God had, has made known to the king what will take place in the future. So the dream is true and its interpretation is trustworthy. Jesus Christ came into this world and built his kingdom. And in 318, I believe it was 318 when Constantinople uh, declared that the Roman Empire would now be, the main religion would be Christianity. All the, op all the roads that lead into Rome now were roads that led out of Rome, and the gospel spread to the four corners of the earth. Praise God for what he does. He's not in a hurry, but he's always on time. Now, I want to encourage your faith this morning that the rock when Jesus was talking to his disciples in Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18, and he was talking about who do men say that I am? I am. See, that's so important that we recognize who Jesus truly is, that he's still on the throne. He is a king of kings and Lord of lords. His kingdom is manifesting increasingly, and one day it will manifest completely, and we're looking forward to that day. And we have a living hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. And it ended up Peter saying, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And God said, Yes, and upon this rock. It wasn't talking about Peter. It was talking about Peter's profession. Upon this partnership, upon this profession, upon the fact that you're stepping in by faith and partnering with me, uh, I am going to make you fishers of men. I'm going to build my kingdom through you and uh, for you and through you. Come unto me, all ye that labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. If a man would deny himself, let him take up his cross and follow him. God's looking for a partnership. So when it talks about the rock, that's Jesus Christ building his kingdom. And so if my count is correct, Babylonian... Medo-Persian, Grecian, Roman, and Jesus Christ. I count five kingdoms, which is the kingdom of grace. Do I believe that? Absolutely. That's why there is, that's why Hitler, if he'd have read this scripture, he would realize world dominance was out of control. Does that mean just to sit back and be passive and wait on the Lord to build his kingdom? No, the rock means a partnership upon this rock. And the very next verse says, and here are the kingdoms, keys to the kingdom. I give you the keys. God has partnered with us to build a kingdom which shall grow and grow and grow. Like the seed in the garden, the mustard seed, Jesus said, would grow into the largest tree in the garden and all the birds would flock into it. I believe this morning that Jesus Christ is Lord and he's building his kingdom on earth. And this pagan king had a dream and God used him and just to prove that he can use anyone at any time. He spoke through a pagan king about the five world governments. And the next government is the government of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So my encouragement is to you. The kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. That's what it says in the book of Revelations. You've got a great hope and a great future, my friend. 
but what God is doing for you and in you, he's inviting you to join him. He's saying, is there anyone, as this wickedness spreads, read Ezekiel chapter 22. It was a dark picture in Israel, just like it's a dark picture in America and around the world. What God is looking for are people that'll step in the gap and pray with persistence and say, Lord, in judgment, remember mercy and be a shining light for the Lord. So we can step back and watch destruction and judgment come, or we can step into the, ba into, into the battle. And 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18 says, he has given us this ministry of reconciliation. Every one of us have a ministry to step in individually, corporately, representing our valley, representing our family, uh, to our friends and neighbors, and love like God loves and to love him with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength, and our neighbor as ourself, that truly we are motivated by love, and we want to, with faith and courage, share this living hope, share the good news that Jesus Christ cares, and he is involved, and he's building his kingdom, and he's inviting us to come unto him and uh, take our yoke upon us and, and learn of him. It's about him. Our focus is on him. We see what's going on around us, but what that does is drive us into his presence. It drives us into his peace and his comfort. And we armor up and we pray without ceasing and we praise the Lord. And that prayer breaks bondages. Psalm chapter 49, it says, praise ye the Lord in many different ways. And it says, and at the end, it says in Psalm 149, I want to end with this, and I should have put a marker in here. It says, praise the Lord. Sing unto the Lord a new song, and his praise in the congregation of the godly ones. Let Israel be glad in his maker. Let the sons of Zion rejoice in their king. Let them praise his name with dancing. Let them sing praises to him with timbrel and lyre, for the Lord takes pleasure in his people. He will beautify the afflicted with Afflicted ones with salvation, let the godly ones exult in glory. Let them sing for joy on their beds. Let the high praises of God be on their mouth and a two-edged sword in their hand. What is the two-edged sword? It's the word of God. It's a word of truth, which ultimately sets free. But look at what it says next. What does praise do? What does the light do? It repels darkness. You want to get rid of darkness? You want to overcome evil? If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's where it starts and we begin to pray and praise God. And it says, to execute vengeance on the nations and punishments on the people, to bind their kings with chains and their nobles with fetters of iron, to execute on them the judgment written. This is an honor for all his godly ones. Praise the Lord. God's vengeance is on darkness and upon evil. God loves the sinner, but he hates the sin. And so what is the light, praise, prayer, all these things do? Building his kingdom spreads the light, the good news of Jesus Christ, and it drives back darkness. You want vengeance against darkness and evil? Partner with the Lord and praise him. Pray like you never did before. In fact, in Isaiah 62, verses 60, 6 and 7, I'm going to try to quote, it says, the Lord was looking for watchmen on the wall that would not keep silent, that who, who, would, um, who would challenge, not ever stop talking about, persist in, and never take rest or give the Lord rest. I thought that was so interesting. Isaiah 62, verse six and seven says, Give yourself no rest and give the Lord rest. Does that mean you lose your peace and you never go to sleep? No, it's talking about that we ask and we keep asking. We seek and we keep seeking. We knock and we keep knocking. We persist. We're not going to give up because God ultimately is going to build his kingdom. And he's inviting us to step into the gap and make a difference in this world. So my encouragement to you this morning Oh, stir your senses in faith because our senses are getting stirred in the flesh. We're hearing all the newscasts and we're surrounded by smoke and fire 
and uh, fires are out of control. And we're reminded that we're so dependent on the Lord for rain. We're so dependent on the Lord for protection. We need the Lord right now. If my people who are called by my name would humble themselves, we're responding to the truth. And we're, we're asking for God's intervention. Just like Daniel, just like Nehemiah, they stepped into the gap. They confessed the sin of their people. And God heard their prayer and positioned them strategically and profoundly and powerfully changed history. God wants to use you, my friend. He loves you dearly. And he is, uh, he is placing us strategically in position for a victory. Praise be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And always remember, the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of our God and of his Christ. And he, Jesus Christ, will reign forever and ever. Isn't that beautiful? I'm looking forward to the day. I want to see what it's like with a new heaven, a new earth, and a new president, a new ruler. And his name is Jesus Christ. And he's King of kings and Lord of lords. God's still on the throne, my friend. And prayer truly does change things. God bless you today. Come join us in the church service whenever you can. We'd love to have you here at Saddle Mountain Fellowship. And uh, we have some awesome worship and praise and fellowship. And uh, it's good to be in the house of the Lord where God's people dwell in unity. God's pleased and present. And God's in the people business. And business is good. God bless you today.